dominated the medieval landscape. And Britain has some of the finest in the world. Today, most are decaying relics, many of their secrets buried in time. Now, historian Ruth Goodman and archaeologists Tom Pinfold and Peter Ginn are turning the clock back to relearn the secrets of the medieval castle builders. This is the ultimate in medieval technology. The origin of our castles is distinctly French, introduced to Britain at the time of the Norman conquest of 1066. Three, two, one, tire. Here in the Burgundy region of France is Guédelon Castle, the world's biggest archaeological experiment. A 25-year project to build a castle from scratch using the same tools, techniques and materials available in the 13th century. It's a lot of hard work at the coalface because this is industry. For the next six months, Ruth, Peter and Tom will experience the daily rigors of medieval construction. Drop down. Yeah. Yep. And everyday life. How workers dressed and ate. You can really smell your food, Ruth. <laughs> and the art of combat. Oh. This is the story of how to build a medieval castle. It's April, and since their arrival a month ago, the team have been learning ancient skills from the Gedelon Masons. Perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They've also set up a base for themselves in the shadow of the castle. Building a castle involves such a lot of people, and they've all got to live somewhere. The 13th century was part of the golden age of castle building, when ever-evolving tactics and fortifications were driven by the legacy of bloody crusades and vicious dynastic struggles. Medieval dynasties sought to expand their influence and protect their gains. They built imposing stone castles, not only to assert power, but more fundamentally, to withstand attack. Now the team learn about building the castle's defensive structures. They look at the ingenious features medieval castle builders devised. And explore the craft behind the weapons they had to resist. Defence for me really is the raison d'etre of a castle. It's not just you know, the battles, the attacking, the defending. It's the structural input that you have to think about. Your defensive, your curtain walls, your towers, things like that. They are defensive structures, I suppose. I mean, they're much more than that, though, aren't they? I mean, they are about defending yourself psychologically. They're about telling everybody, don't even try it. And what about the weapons, too? I mean, what could they actually do against a castle? How effective were they? Yeah. I guess, how many men do you need to defend a castle? I think you need some ruddy, great big stores of food. <laughs> <laughs> and castles, you know, people sometimes, you know, knights and princesses, but it isn't. It's mostly about the likes of us, isn't it? It's about everybody else. And yeah. how do we survive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a castle like this at Gedelon would have been built for a prosperous lord who wanted to display his wealth and power, and also needed his home to be strong enough to withstand potential attack. And this dictates much of its design, with 36 feet high curtain walls protecting the courtyard and residential spaces. Entry is via a twin-towered gatehouse, and at each corner above the crenellated walls, there will be four round towers the highest of which will be the Great Tower, a superb vantage point at nearly 100 feet high. 
in charge of the defensive structure of the castle is Master Mason, Florian Renucci. He's traveled the world studying the ancient secrets behind medieval stonework. Yedelon's walls are over 12 feet thick in places. Today, the masons are placing a special long stone called a butis into a section of castle wall, designed specifically to reinforce it against attack. The butis is to connect the front of the wall, yeah. front part, to the, uh, the stone inside the wall. Right. Uh, the butis, for instance, you have one here. This stone here is very long. It's here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can and see that. yeah. We have to have a wall really um, strong. Yeah. This wall has to resist an enemy. Yeah. And a better way to fight a castle yeah. is to throw stone <laughs> to the okay, wall. Yeah. If we don't put booties, the front part of the wall will go down. You can really see from this wall that you've got the external face, the internal face, and the bit in the middle, the, the infill. Exactly. We are going to put one British. Can you help us? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Very good. You can use strong, Peter. I don't need to. That's, <laughs> that's the beauty yes. of this. Yes, uh, try to be always in the middle of the stone. Right. right. It's a heavy yeah. stone to have a strong castle. Booty stones are not just placed at random. They're fixed into the wall at three feet intervals to give maximum strength. The booties go in the, in the middle right. of, the, of the joint. So it's just linking in, but it's so clever because the pressure is now spread between two stones. Yes, we have to think everything. It's like um, um, a game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like medieval Tetris. At Gedelon, they're using a medieval formula to make mortar, mixing water with quarry sand and lime putty. Unlike lime produced industrially, it will take many centuries to set completely. We were afraid about it. Because thousands of tons of stone being held together, it was a bit of a risk at the start then. Exactly. And uh, it's perhaps the first time in Gedelon that we use this old way of making mortar. Through experimentation, they've discovered that clay impurities in the quarry sand give this mortar great strength. So the experimental archaeology has actually given you a really good building substance to build your castle. Exactly. Uh, Tom's just putting the mortar down here, and he's making it rough. So when the stone goes down, that mortar will press into the the cracks of the stone. If it was smooth, then you just have gaps. So if there's a bump in the stone and smooth mortar, it, it just wouldn't touch it. Whereas because he's making it all rough, it will squidge together and just keep that stone absolutely solidly fixed into place. It's looking good, Tom. Every stone has to be in line because this is going to go up and up and up, potentially another four metres. These stones are slightly off. Your build is slightly off, and eventually it'll collapse. Now the stone will be solid. Solid. The biggest threat to castles were sieges. These were far more common than pitched battles, and could last for months, even years. If they couldn't get through the gates, invaders could try going over the walls with towers and ladders, or mining under them. But another, more sophisticated means of attack developed. From basic stone throwers to mangonels, cuillard, and trebuchet, a range of deadly medieval war machines evolved. These came to dominate siege warfare for hundreds of years, until they were ultimately superseded by the cannon. 
The largest ever trebuchet, it is thought, was that commissioned by Edward Longshanks, King of England, in the War of Scottish Independence. And he was trying to bring down Stirling Castle. It was a vast beast called War Wolf <laughs> as a nickname. Disassembled, it took 30 wagons to move it. Five master carpenters worked on it along with 49 other workers. And it could hurl an object of 300 pounds weight with accuracy. 30 miles from Guédelon is Saint-Brisson Castle, which houses a collection of replica siege engines. The Romans introduced basic catapults to Britain. But by the 13th century, the development of counterweight technology saw the introduction of deadly, high-powered stone-hurling war machines. They were used in sieges to bombard defending troops and collapse castle walls. The crew wear protective helmets in case the machine malfunctions. How big do you think that counterweight is? How's it going, Tom? It's good, mate. It's amazing how only four people can manoeuvre such a heavy counterweight. Yeah, I mean, what? that's about 500 kilograms. The energy you're putting into that to raise it up is going to be stored as potential energy. And then when it's released, this, which is about 10 kilograms, this ball is going to be swung out and flung into the distance. They reckon it will go about 100 metres. Looking good. Right, he's just going to lock this off. There we go. Tension's on the pin. Now it's locked off, they can unwind this rope so that when it fires, or when it's loosed, the rope doesn't hold it back. So here we go, unwinding the rope. Whoa, watch those handles. I mean, this is a well-trained crew, they know what they're doing. I and mean, this is uh, it's, uh, very different, isn't it, from doing it in peacetime as it would be in the heat of battle. I see things like the shouting, the noise. Yeah. These ropes can snap, the wood can snap. Here we go. The ball, the projectile, into the sling, and it's ready to go. I think you need. So standing see. back. <laughs> standing <Okay>. back. <laughs> so we're just moving back. Go to the seclusion zone. I imagine if it was in the heat of battle, <laughs> you'd just be there. Yeah. yeah. You'd feel quite lonely if you were the guy who was about to pull the rope. Right, we're going to count down. Cinq, quatre, trois. Two, one, two, Look how much energy okay, is still yeah. in there. And you have to get the mathematics absolutely right. The difference between the length of that arm and the length of the rope and the things. If you don't get that spot on, it can fly backwards instead of flying forwards. But if you, de <laughs> if you deconstruct this, it's essentially scaffolding. It's a, it's a mason shape. It ball. is. It's the ropes that move And it's on exactly site. the same mathematics yeah. that the masons are yeah. using. I mean, it's really, it's sort of simple, but it's also really quite sophisticated. If you can build a castle, you can, you can... fight a castle. Well, that's the arms race that's happening in our period, isn't it? And the castles get more strong, more developed, more technical, and so the siege weapons become stronger, more powerful, more technical. Yeah. Each driving each other further and further onwards. It's not fast, though, is it? No. no. <laughs> Despite being slow, these mighty war machines were greatly feared in the Middle Ages. Some fortified towns surrendered at the very sight of them. All right. Shall we go and have a look? Projectiles ranged from carved stone or mortar balls like these to rotting animal carcasses intended to spread disease and even the heads of defeated soldiers to really lower morale. It's funny, isn't it, looking at the damage, you know, because it is just a small hole. But I suppose when you think again against a stone wall, it's, it's going to keep going until it finds a weakness. This is one the hammer, isn't another. it? Yeah. Yeah, a hammer doesn't crack it's something It's not a great explosion, blow. it's... The persistent drip, drip, drip until you crack. A 
As well as being an archaeologist, Tom is a midshipman in the Royal Naval Reserve with a special interest in military history. He's been looking into what kind of armor an ordinary soldier might have worn in the 1200s. Not everyone could afford the expensive metal helmets and mail worn by wealthy lords and knights. A more basic form of protection commonly worn for combat was the gambeson, a padded linen tunic whose main protective element was sheep's wool. Tom's visiting Ruth in the hovel. She wants to make him a gambeson, and the process starts with the sheep's wool. Ruth, when you asked me here for a fitting for my protective clothing, <laughs> I was thinking chainmail and armour. <laughs> That's not the case, is it? No, no, no. This is well, it is, but it's not. This is cloth armour. Cloth armour. Yeah. And that's good, is it? It is good. Yeah, you're uh. going to be glad of this, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> so you may have lots and lots and lots of layers of linen, and then a big fat layer of wool, prepared wool, and then more and more and more layers, many, and then you've got to stitch the whole lot together really tight. Not so it's like big and fluffy like a duvet. Right. But compacted compacted down. Compacted right down into something truly dense. I mean, it's almost, this is, Modern body armour is the evolution from this. You yeah. still that balance between protection and manoeuvrability and trying to cover as much of the body as possible. And this is the ancestor of Kevlar, yeah. <laughs> of the bulletproof <laughs> vest. Here it goes. One of the defining visual features of medieval castles is their arrow loops. The ingenious design of these simple slits in the walls provided protection and gave castle arches a huge advantage. Very good. Gedelon Mason, Constantin Lemel, has specially shaped a stone needed for building an arrow loop in a corner tower. Before they mortar the stone in place, they need to be sure it fits. Right, so that's in position. I thought that was going to go the other way around, actually. I thought. Uh, no, uh, uh, we have to alternate. We have to, to, to have a, a long face here and after a yeah. short one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and when you have a short one, you have a long here yeah. and a short under. It's to, to get something uh, very stronger when you cross uh, the, the stones. Yeah, OK. The funnel-shaped design of the arrow loop, tapering to a mere three-inch gap, gave attackers outside only a tiny slit to aim at while the defenders could look out without being seen. The arrow loops sloped down, so archers could see invaders, even at the foot of the tower. If it were um, like this, for instance, we yeah, can't right. uh, can hit people uh, over uh, there. fight and, and shoot people. So people, got step so, <laughs> so people can be uh, in front of the tower, no problem for them. Completely yeah. safe. I guess also this is a weak point of the castle, isn't it? You're actually creating a crack in your castle wall, so you need to reinforce it. People said that in the 13th century, the round tower was very useful to resist when stones are throwing on, on the tower. Because when the stones are coming, the, the round form um, used to be stronger. Well, I guess you spread the pressure, don't you? The stone hits there and it's curved, and all these other stones exactly. take the impact. Uh, exactly. Well, Peter and I are probably firing arrows out. We just break our arrows on the inside, so... Of course, it'll be interesting to see if you fire an arrow or a bolt back in. That's it. That's the trick, isn't it? If you're yeah. attacking, you want to be able to know... You at least scare people, if not kill them, <laughs> on the inside. <laughs> 
there'll be around 40 arrow loops in the finished castle. In order to test their effectiveness, Peter and Tom will need a suitable weapon. One of the most infamous at the time was the crossbow. First seen in 4th century BC China, by the 1200s, crossbows were increasingly used in European siege warfare. Crossbows were probably introduced into Britain around the time of the Norman Conquest. In some ways, they were less effective than the longbows. They took an awful lot longer to load, so the rate of fire was much, much slower. Out in the battlefield, in the heat of the moment, they were pretty useless. But in a siege, it was a completely different thing. Behind some nice, safe walls, you had time. And it was the sort of weapon that anybody could use with no training and no skill at all. Richard the Lionheart eventually met his end when a crossbow bolt fired by a boy in 1199 pierced him in the shoulder. The resulting infection did for him. As a weapon that made knights more vulnerable to lowly foot soldiers, some despised it for breaking the conventions of chivalry. But the art of crossbow making became a whole industry by the 13th century. In Britain, it survives to this day among a few specialist craftsmen, like bowyer Chris Jury. This is what's going to be known as the crossbow prod, which is basically the, the bow on a crossbow. What kind of wood is this? This is yew wood. Now, yew wood is probably the best wood for making a bow. In any piece of yew, you get the, the sapwood and the heartwood. The sapwood is good in tension, which means it can stretch, and the heartwood is good in compression, which means it can crush. So the two grow naturally together in a single piece of wood to form a, a natural spring. Chris uses a spoke shave to take off the bark. I would imagine in the medieval period, they would have done it in like a production process. So it would be done in, in fairly large batches. Apprentices would have started off maybe the sort of age of 13, 14. After seven years, then you was a journeyman. He was, he was nearly at the point where he was a master of the craft. Then you'd be a master bow maker. And by that time, you wouldn't even get your hands dirty with the making of the bows. <laughs> you just let your minions get on and do it for you, basically. So as I am your apprentice, uh -huh. is there any chance I can have a go with that? Yeah, of course you can, yes. You want to be gentle, but you've also got to put a bit of pressure on it. It is, yeah, it's quite a delicate task because you don't want to be cutting into the sapwood at all. You just want to remove the bark. Taking off lumps there. <laughs> don't, to... look. Uh... don't look, don't look. I'll start down. <laughs> the next stage is to taper the prod with an axe. Yeah, I can tell you use an axe before. You've definitely got a, a better technique than that with a spoke shape. <laughs> you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> the more we do this, the more likely it is that I'm going to make a mistake. <laughs> you need all ten toes, do you? Yeah, every time on your own legs. <laughs> Gone. That's it, that's good, that's good. Yeah, a bit of aggression is okay. Yeah, that's it, gone. A draw knife is used to further smooth and shape the crossbow that's prod. It, it that's it, it's still way too thick, so you can take off a lot of wood. I suppose, like with everything, it's just about getting your eye in, understanding the material you're working with and understanding the tools, and hopefully it all comes together. Yes, that's why certain tools, like the axe, and like the spoke shape and the draw knife are ideal because they follow the grain. So while the tools look a bit crude, they actually do the job rather well. But you can understand how the apprentices did seven years because it's quite a it's quite a specialist kind of task really. So it's a, yeah, that's starting to take shape rather nicely. If you've done good work with your tapers, then it should bend relatively evenly. Well, I think I've done uh, exceptional work with my taper. Well, so. it, 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 <laughs> it, well, it looks it looks pretty good. Carpenter Sam Rooney 
has come all the way from New Zealand to work at Gedelon. In his spare time, he makes traditional bows. Today, Sam and Ruth are experimenting with making a crossbow arrow, known as a bolt or quarrel, which was shorter, heavier, and more deadly than a regular arrow. You imagine an arrow, whether it be for a crossbow or, or a longbow, and you imagine a little stick. Yeah. Why are you starting with a great big piece of wood? Mainly for mass producing arrows. You can have several lengths of a tree and then just split it into small squares. So I suppose, yes, I suppose if you think really mass production, that makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got to make 20,000 yeah. for a castle, yeah. the amount of time it would take, take you to time. find yeah. 20,000 sticks that were yeah. the right size and shape. You have to send an army of people <laughs> off to gather twigs. Yeah, yeah. Right. whereas two or three trees would do you your 20,000 arrows. Yeah. Right, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. <laughs> You're just squaring this off at the moment, are you? Yeah, I'm just squaring it off right. using a, uh, a medieval bandsaw. The thin piece of wood is then cut into individual strips, which will be shaped to make each bolt shaft. And it'll yeah. be practically a Keep circle, yeah. like this one here. All right, so yeah. that one's pretty much finished. Yeah, that's about as round as you're going to need it, yeah. isn't it? So we're going to drill a small hole in the end of the bolt. A metal bolt head is then attached. You would not want that pushed through you, would you? Oh, no. a foul-looking <laughs> thing. And the slit is cut so it can be fletched. It's recorded that in 1250, a chief English quarrel maker produced 25,000 quarrels a year and could be expected to make 100 in a single day. It is a it huge amount of work, all of this, isn't it? Well, yeah, I guess so. Bows are still really woven into our modern life. I mean, think of the surnames. Bowyer, Fletcher, Stringer, Archer. And then all the number of phrases that come from one form of archery or another, things like to pick a quarrel or a bolt from the blue or he's got lots of strings to his bow. They're all archery terms. They finish off their bolt by warming up a medieval glue made from an unusual source. It's made from the bladder of a fish. You actually like, get the bladder and dry it out. Show a bit of glue in here. So it's Life just a bit of glue like... on the leather, yeah, shove it in the here. slot. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. There yeah. we go, one quarrel. Well, thanks very much. I shall um, give it a go. OK. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> thanks, Sam. Mm. By the end of the 12th century, a new design of crossbow was introduced. The addition of a metal stirrup enabled the crossbowman to hold the bow with his foot and draw back the string either with both hands or a belt hook. This was known as spanning the bow. Peter has come to make the stirrup with Martin Claudel, who's been a blacksmith at Gedelon for four years. And they use a process called smith and striking. The smith is the blacksmith, he's the guy doing the thinking. He's got the little hammer, he's moving the metal around, he taps it. The striker has the big hammer, and that is me. I always hate doing the striking. I'm not, I've got no rhythm, basically. But then he hits, I hit, he hits, I hit, and when he hits the anvil, I stop. OK, we good? And, uh... You're done. All oh, right. Peter and Martin will hammer the iron flat and then bend it at four corners, making a stirrup shape. I, th I think we got away with that. Um, it's certainly starting to take shape. We've got, we got, we got a kink in it, we've got a bend. And in these two ends, he's going to fire weld. So he's, he's basically splitting the metal, so when they come together, they interlock, 
he'll heat all that up and then he'll basically smack it as hard as he can and compact that back into a single piece of metal, essentially creating a fire weld, which is ultimately very, very strong. Which will give it the strength it needs, because if you think about putting your foot in it and pulling on that crossbow in order to cock it, you don't want your metal coming apart. He's going to ramp up the heat so it goes white hot. The reason for the darkness in here is so he can see the colours. Here we go. That's fantastic. Are you yeah. happy? I'm happy. Yeah. Back at the hovel, Ruth has enlisted some help to stitch Tom's gamberson together. Hello. Oh, hi, chaps. Oh, oh dear. Hello. What are these? You're making rugs or something, are <laughs> you? Uh, you told me they were making you a suit of armour. <laughs> <laughs> we are very, really? very, very slowly. That's the first uh, layers of cloth all sewn together with the wool going on top. Yeah. And then I've started quilting this panel. I'll so it's like a front piece and a back piece? Yeah. yeah. And then as soon as you start sewing, you can see it's starting to compress it down. Look, have yeah. a feel of the difference of that. Look, look how wobbly that is, soft and wobbly. Yeah. And then feel where it is when it's sewn. Oh, wow. Well, I think so. It's nice to be fighting the winter, because this looks quite warm. <laughs> I think it's quite warm. Mm. And in fact, I have to be honest, don't fight any time soon. You won't <laughs> believe... This is a day's work. I mean, I've done nothing all day today except this. Well, who's wearing gambersons? They've been worn by um, men at arms, fairly ordinary soldiers, you know, yeah. uh, and being worn by the rich soldiers in combination with chainmail. Mm. So they've been worn by quite a lot of people. Yeah, I'd certainly be happier if I was on the walls wearing a gamberson to sort of stand there with my crossbow than I would be if I'd yeah. just. Yeah, I don't shirt. know. <laughs> <laughs> in the 13th century, gamberson making was a skilled craft done mainly by men. You keep your right arm underneath, so you just keep poking and pointing. And I find if you stretch the cloth with your left hand... Blimey. Yeah, blimey. I'm glad you said that. Now, you've missed. Look, you've gone come up right over there. Don't want to go back down. Yeah. You've got to come up in line. OK, OK. He's not a natural, is he? At least I'm giving it a go, eh? At least you're giving it a go. <laughs> no, no, missed try again. again. Oh. <laughs> this is like pot luck. Right, this time. OK. That's better. That'll do. That'll do. It's good enough. Right. Yeah. And you need to pull really tight, though don't break the thread. Yeah. Marvellous. And then straight back down again. Straight back down. That's it. And catch it with the other arm. Do not envy you. One eye It better. is slow, isn't it? It is. Chris is nearing the final stages of his work on the crossbow. OK, so here you have your bow, all nicely shaped and uh, expertly tapered <laughs> and nice and smooth. Um, and now the next stage is to make sure it bends evenly. The prod is ready to be put under tension using a tiller stick. If the bow is not evenly shaped, the prod may snap. So now we're basically examining the curve of the bow. Right. So the, tr the <laughs> yeah. trick is you need to spot the weak bits before they develop into a problem and shave them away. So even after all this time and all this work, there's still actually jeopardy about whether it'll actually there's be a massive, effective... There's a massive amount of jeopardy involved in doing it. This is the real art of the bow. You need to train your eye to see the curve and to notice any flat spots in the curve. Yeah, I was going to say, because to be honest, it looks pretty good to me. So we're happy with that. They'll, they'll make a good shooting bow. deep ditch and sloped walls at the base of the castle 
are designed to make them harder to approach. The only entrance across the ditch is a 10-foot high bridge to the main gate, a structure which relies on a very humble element to hold it together, the nail. Six hundred and seventy-seven were needed to make this bridge, all forged on site. Martin the blacksmith makes all the nails for the doors and fixtures in the castle. Inspired by a popular story from the Middle Ages, Ruth has come to the blacksmith's forge. I'm going to have a go at making a nail. This, believe it or not, is a really female activity. The story goes that when they needed the nails to crucify Christ, the blacksmith that they asked refused to be involved, and his wife stepped up. I'll make them, she said. <laughs> it was a story that had a lot of popularity in the 13th century, and as a result, there are lots and lots of pictures of women working at a blacksmith's forge, nail making. Frequently rather ugly, demonized women. Great big hook noses. But dressed just like me. This one little piece of metal that we're working, how many nails will it make? Maybe between 10 and uh, 20, maybe. It's not many, is it, for this not much many. work? <laughs> I mean, I suppose that really explains why things like furniture are made entirely with no nails. They're all made of wood with wood joints. So you only use your nails where you really need them. It's a, it's a precious thing, the nail. It's a funny thing that when you talk about the past and you list all the crafts, people imagine that that means it's only men. If you look at the lists of guilds people, in London, and indeed in Paris, it's amazing how many crafts are, in fact, headed up by a female name. There were female blacksmiths. Once the iron has turned red in the hearth, it softens and can be worked. Almost ready. Almost ready. Ruth is going to try smith and striking with Marta. I can scarcely lift this hammer, let alone do anything useful with it. We'll see. Scary moment. <laughs> I've got a block of wood to stand on because I'm short. Oh, mm. sorry. I'm not on strike, am I? Oh, terrible. My hits are not quite central, and so I'm making dents down the edges, and he's being very... <laughs> ..sorting out all my... Mm. The metal is heated again and again. Nice and sharp on the end. And gradually driven into a point before being squared up. The head is then shaped. That's it. And just straightened out. And plunged in the water to cool it. Just like that. I can really see why 13th century, people were finding ways of using as few nails as possible. Such a lot of work. The stirrup is in a fairly straight line. To make the finished weapon, crossbow expert Robin Knight binds Peter's iron stirrup and Tom's U prod. I mean, one of the interesting things for me about making this crossbow is you're relying on a lot of different skills. You know, well, blacksmith was... making a stirrup, 
bow yeah, you're there was, making, isn't it? There was no such thing as a crossbow maker. One man made the tiller, the blacksmith made all of the ironwork, another man made the string. That's where you get the surname Stringer. When the, the guy at the end of the process got all the bits together, he didn't know how each individual part was made because to him, and they, the, the trades were before the guilds, were called mysteries. To him, it was a mystery. Right, it's just simple. <laughs> it just wasn't aware of how it was done. Group of individuals with very specific knowledge and skills. Exactly. Bring together almost like a, a flat pack of a crossbow, and then one yeah. man. One man put it together. Now, what separates the crossbow from the longbow is really in defence. You don't actually need a huge amount of strength or skill or to use it. Use training, it effectively. For, training for longbows took from about the age of seven. Crossbowman, yeah. you can train him up in half a day. But he's still got the capability of killing you with half a day's training as a longbowman with 15 years training. I mean, this is a weapon that but was actually the, the, banned by the church, wasn't it? it was like, a oh. weapon unfit to be used on Christians, only to be used on heathens and Saracens. Yeah. Nobody liked crossbows. Unfortunately, you get the odd bulls like me that sort of quite like them. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now we come to the crunch. We're going to span the bow. Moment of truth. Mo the moment of truth. Now, Stir it works. Get your foot in there. OK, is everybody? Holy m mother. So that's, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? It looks solid. It's a proper piece of killing machinery, that. Back at the castle, the team are almost ready for basic siege combat. Look at you two relaxing. <laughs> I've been away working. <laughs> this is it. There's your stirrup, mate. I'll come in between you if that's all right. Looks pretty good. Are you surprised? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'll be honest, it wasn't me that did most of it. <laughs> this is our medieval killing oh, machine. Got, got, got that's, that's quite a long trigger there. It's a long trigger. Oh, wow. And you... That's our ammunition, is it? Oh. OK. Yeah, it looks quite deadly. Oh, that does, that looks horrible, does it doesn't it? I mean, you think if you've dipped that in you know, some animal dung or something like that, you've actually got a biological weapon there as well. Mm. You're going to infect. So, and even if you don't kill them straight off, yeah. you're going to do damage. It's not a nice weapon. Is there any such thing? Well, very true, very true. So, Ruth, how is uh, Tomo's Gambeson coming along? <laughs> well, it's not finished, I can tell you is that. It, that's it there, is it? <laughs> yeah, where's well, the front panel? I've got that's, it sort of shaped and... That's looking pretty mostly good. ..mostly bound. It's, a, it's a pretty rigid beast. Oh. Have I got the right shape? It's quite heavy. Ooh. Oh! oh. <laughs> Tense oh, come on, up. Come on, get you, get you. Oh, blimey. So how much more work is there to well, do I'm on this? Well, I'm going to do the back panel. You're not getting sleeves. I've given up on uh. sleeves. Initially, I was going to plan you the proper full gambeson with the sleeves, but I'm sorry. I think it would be a bit like a straitjacket if it had <laughs> sleeves, but... I found an bank. ancient <laughs> gambeson that's at the end of its life, oh. if you want to try a complete one on. But... Yeah. Put one on Peter. Oh, no. I told you it was a bit smelly and ancient, <laughs> didn't I? This is classic gin. It's smelly. Oh, it's <laughs> might actually be alive. It smells this. like a tent, that. It's like a straitjacket, yeah. doesn't Arms it? Arms out. See, look how much softer this one is than, than the other one. This is much more flexible. <laughs> I quite like mine, to be honest. I like the cleanness of mine. Cleanness. Oh, do me up. It is like in a straitjacket. You start at the top, do you? Shall I hold it across? Yeah. You could just imagine some chaps trying to get into all this lot in a hurry, can't you? <laughs> You're <laughs> a bit of team effort, isn't it, actually? <laughs> <laughs> they are. Go on, I'll do. What do you think? <laughs> Yes, this is... Seats you. This is pretty good. Not just yeah. sustaining. You feel strong? Yeah. You've <laughs> <laughs> got a few little weak points. It's gonna protect. Those who could afford it would have covered their gambeson with a chainmail shirt weighing over 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> if there's only one way of doing this... Oh, no, this is like... Right hand to the right piece. Oh, my hair's stuck in it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have a bowl stop by the time I get out of here. Can you get in? 
Oh, we've lost the sleeve on this side. <laughs> 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 That's so glamorous. There we, we go. Up. Oh. <laughs> there we go. How's oh, yeah. your movement now? I mean, you see, it's a it's bit... It's good. It's it, a bit more restrictive under the arms. It's actually it? not that restrictive. It's just the weight, you it know, is it heavy. is. It's heavy. It's really heavy. But it's not that heavy. I can still... Oh, 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 oh. Do and you see the chain mail on, it actually looks like it would give you better protection than I thought originally against yeah, something like this. It is this. quite dense, isn't it? That's fine. That is actually, that's actually fine. <laughs> I'll take a run up. Close contact. You're going to be yeah. pretty safe from a sword blow, aren't you? In that? Yeah. Now we get to see him taking that off. <laughs> We're not going to help him then. No. Oh, sorry, Peter. No, no. This is going to be the amusing moment. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> I've seen, some, I've seen some wonderful period images of blokes trying to get out of their their mail shirts. Go on. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. The <laughs> <laughs> years I spent in the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what the pictures show. This is exactly what they show. <laughs> Unbelievable. <Way! laughs> oh. Wow, that's a weight off your shoulders. The team are going to give the Gambeson a sterner test using their new crossbow. I can't tell I you how glad I'm not really yeah. in the 13th century facing an invading yeah, army. Already. I just can't imagine how horrible that would be. Bolts shot from a high-powered crossbow could be as deadly as bullets and shell fire. OK, you can duck down so you can rest. Hide. Thumbs on there. Oh, I okay. wish it looked less like a person. <laughs> <laughs> There's no head. Oh, okay. it's horrible. Here no, there is. It's very, very small. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Three, two, one. Ah! Thank goodness for that, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> Load you up, big boy. <laughs> You're below that. Toi. Duh. Uh. Uh. Nice. You meanie. You yeah. meanie. Well, I've gone to the side and low. Yeah, yeah. Should we have a look? Yeah. How are we looking? <laughs> How... oh, it has gone through. It's gone through, is it? That okay, much. Yeah. I really right. expected that to be, you know, up to yeah, up to the Yeah, I flight. thought it was going to be <laughs> spaded into you, yeah. But let's not forget the, uh, the quality of the Gamson. You know, that layered approach has obviously worked. While some sieges were won by overpowering the castle, it was often something far more basic which finally forced the defenders to surrender. In truth, when castles fell, it was rarely to actual siege engines and far more frequently to starvation. Indeed, in 1215 at Rochester, besieged inside the castle, the people were holding out. King John, on the outside, had amassed five trebuchets that were battering the walls for two months. Inside, food was running short, and they looked around them and began to eat their expensive war horses. And it was only when they had finished eating every horse that they surrendered. Defending your food was a vital aspect of strategic castle design. With this in mind, Gedelon's great tower contains its own food store and a well. It's the castle's ultimate stronghold. If the walls were breached, it would be possible to fall back to the Great Tower. Next to the Great Tower is the kitchen, where Ruth begins preparing a meal fit for fighting men. Meanwhile, 
Peter and Tom are about to put the arrow loops of the Great Tower to the test. That's quite a narrow target, isn't it, really? Yeah. You know, I mean, do you ever really aim to hit someone on the other side, or are you just trying to get the bolt yeah. out the gap? Can't actually see much out of there. I guess there's only one thing to do. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> are you aiming for anything out there, or are you just...? Just aiming for the gap, my friend. Aiming for the gap. Right, bolts in, touching string. That was fast. In this environment, that seemed far more powerful and these a lot faster. Well, I guess from a defensive point of view then, something like that, shooting out the, the loop, you know, it's a bit of a fear factor straight away, isn't it? Satisfied with the defensive capacity of Gedelon's arrow loops on the inside, Tom and Peter set about seeing how resistant they are to attack from the outside. Do you think we can get a, a bolt through that gap? Luckily, we're not under fire. Um, we're not uh, a rock stone at us. I reckon we definitely do it in six. Should we give it a go, then? Yeah, let's give it a go. OK. So you're going to load for me? I'll load. Arrow in the groove. String, it's loaded. Oh, that was terrible. That no, it wasn't. After many attempts, a shot finally finds its target. Yes! A feat that would be somewhat harder to achieve in the heat of battle. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that, no, that was lucky. <laughs> well, still. I mean, that was a good height on there as well. That would have gone in about head height inside. Yeah. Architecturally, these arrow loops, they work for this castle, don't they? You can be in there, you can fire out, but if you're outside here, trying to fire in, it's not impossible, but it's, it's, it's lucky if you do. While Peter and Tom return to the building work, in the castle kitchen, Ruth is preparing food for medieval men at arms. It is slightly conjectural. We have to sort of look at as many sources as we can to come up with what a 13th century soldier would actually be eating. So it largely comes down to pork. Pork was considered to be the food which was most compatible with the human body. Medieval thinking was that the body of someone of high social standing digested and responded to food differently to that of a common man. So their food needed to be cooked differently. For the common soldiery, it just all goes in. Fat, skin, marrow, all good for building strong fighting bodies. This broth, or pottage, simply contains pork, onions, beans and some herbs. So that should just quietly cook for the next couple of hours. So almost the same ingredients, pork, the beans and the onions, are also going to form the basis of dish suitable for the Lord. But it is the cooking methods that make the difference. 13th century medical and ideas thought of the stomach as a cauldron that had to cook through the food. They thought that by cooking food itself, you could be helping the stomach to do that process. So for the Lord, we start by boiling the meat. It's parboiled, part cooked by boiling it. Then we roast it, which is the stage I've reached here. And then, once it's mostly roasted, it's going to come off the spit again, cut up, and then fried, likely. So this is still running a little bit pink. Done to a turn, as they say. 
meaning to within one turn of the spit, which is exactly what I want, ready for this last quick flash fry. Although we call it frying, it's more like sort of braising. I shan't give it long. About two minutes and it'll be done. And that with the beans and a sprinkle of dandelion leaves should make him one of the most fearsome warriors in Christendom. It's nearly time to down tools at the end of the day. But first, there's a special delivery to the top of the tower. Oh, you can really smell your food, Ruth. <laughs> what oh, have you I got for us? Smoke. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Rose on cue. Oh, hot. All right, over. crockery. Crockery. Fried onions. Fried onions. Tomo's food. Beans. My food. Oh, pork. Really nicely food. balanced diet, then. Oh, yeah. So, you know, where do you fancy yourself on the social scale, really? Well, I know where I am on the social <laughs> <Yeah>. scale. <laughs> <laughs> I'm roughing at the moment. Oh, and by the way, dandelion petals, they mm. are associated with the planet Mars. Everything. So you're going to be that martial by the time oh. you're finished. Oh, That's the point. I see. Yeah. So we're going to start with. I'll start with a bit of pottage. Some man of arms. Yeah. yeah. I know you're a man. I'll eat this. So I'll start working. <laughs> I'm going go to go next bit of that thrice cooked yeah. pork. <laughs> so anyway, it would all look more lovely, up. wouldn't it, if it was on silver platters <laughs> and there were beautiful napkins and so forth, but never mind. Oh, it's, got, it's got that rustic look to it. Yeah, I'm good at rustic. I don't really do posh, pretty food. But if you're up on the walls in guard duty, <coughs> reckon you actually want the kind of pottage, almost stew-type meal. You can just, you know, you don't have to think about it. You can just enjoy your food. Yeah, it's going to warm you up. Of course, I suppose, you know, if you're in a castle, this is a great meal on day one of the siege. <laughs> but <laughs> by day four, you're starting to look at the stocks and hey, how, how much have we got? And as it drags on. As much as anything, food is a weapon of war. Yeah. Exactly. Next time, interior design, 13th century style, which means mud, paint, and a fiery furnace. Can you imagine living in a world with no electric lights, 